Welcome back. We have gathered here once again in my living room to talk about T9 predictive text. And in particular, my T9 enabled macro pad. If this is your first time hearing about this, or if you need a refresher, I will put a link to the original video somewhere up here. The TLDR is that I designed this standalone keypad to allow you to type on your computer using T9 predictive text. In this video, I wanted to follow up with some more technical details about my project and about T9 in general. But first, very quickly, I wanted to let you know that I do have a bunch of these for sale on my Etsy page and they are fully customizable, so you can change the entire library of words that lives on here. And if you get tired of the T9 thing, you can actually use it as a normal macro pad or number pad. You can customize it to do whatever you want when you type with it. And don't freak out, the hardware and software is still completely open source. You can download it and build this at home using parts you can buy anywhere. I actually think it's a pretty reasonable first DIY project if you're looking to get into this kind of stuff. I actually would love to see you build it yourself. And to encourage that, I also have the bare circuit boards and keycaps available as their own items on the Etsy store. If you do decide to grab something from Etsy, please know it goes a really long way in helping me design and produce more open source projects like this. I invest a ton of time and frankly money into these projects and it's very helpful to have some spare change sitting around when I inevitably blow something up and need to get some spare parts, so thank you. Without further ado, let's jump into the nitty gritty of how the T9 algorithm actually works. I'm gonna keep things at a high-ish level, so if you've never written any code before, you should still be able to follow along, hopefully. And full disclosure, I have not actually seen any of the original T9 source code, so I don't know for certain that what I'm about to talk about is precisely how this algorithm was implemented on your old Nokia, but given some computer science fundamentals and the resources that were available at the time, I think this is a pretty reasonable guess. So let's dive in with some footage that I took a few months ago when I started this video. Uh, if I look younger and more innocent, that's why. Let's talk about how the T9 algorithm works at a high level. As you can see, eight of the number keys also have letters on them. When you enter a sequence using those keys, T9 will effectively search all of the possible combinations of letters associated with those keys for valid words. If, for example, we entered the sequence 4, 6, T9 would have to search through all of these letter combinations. Now, each of the combos you see will fall into one of three categories. They are either A, nonsense, B, the start of a real word, or C, a complete word. So T9 takes the first valid word it finds and renders it wherever you're typing. It's optimistic that that's what you were trying to type. However, as you can see, it might be wrong. We may have wanted to type in instead of go. If we want to enter one of the other valid words, we can use the dedicated swap button, which is usually the star key, to cycle through all the options. This might seem like it'll happen all the time and require a bunch of extra keystrokes, but in reality, those collisions become less and less common as your word gets longer. I find that once you hit the four to five letter mark, you rarely have to use the swap key, at least with my implementation. And fewer collisions means that the algorithm actually gets faster as we add more characters. So if we hit another key, let's use four again, T9 discards all of the nonsense and then performs searches based only on the words and prefixes that we determine to be valid. As that list gets shorter, the algorithm has to perform fewer and fewer searches. It's pretty neat. All right, time to go one level deeper. I just talked extensively about searches and how the T9 algorithm needs to perform a bunch of them every time the user hits a key. So it should go without saying that the searches need to be fast, otherwise the user is going to experience lag as they type, and that's unacceptable. Fortunately, there is a type of data structure that allows us to store our word library in a format that is optimized for searching. This data structure is called a try. 
which is a type of tree. Not confusing at all. A tree is made up of a bunch of nodes, each representing some chunk of stored data. And all of the nodes reference or point to any number of other nodes in the tree. But there cannot be any cycles. This means that if we pick any node as a starting point and follow these pointers to hop from node to node, every route must lead to a dead end. This is critical for T9. If we are performing a search, which requires us to hop between these nodes, and we end up hopping between the same set of nodes over and over again, the algorithm is going to effectively freeze. The user is not going to be able to type anything. There are some other rules for how trees are meant to be formed, but for this discussion, the no cycles rule is by far the most important. So how do we convert a list of words into a try? Basically, we're going to build a try in which each node is either a prefix of a word or a word itself. And every prefix node will point to any prefixes that build on top of it. I think it's gonna be easiest to show an actual example. Suppose we had a library with only one word in it, cat. Let's build a searchable try to represent this very boring library. The first thing we need to do is list out all of the valid prefixes and create nodes for them. So in our case, we have C, CA, and we'll add one for the full word, CAT. Now, as soon as we link these nodes up, as described earlier, we are done building the try and we can start searching. So to search for a given word, we just start at the first letter and we work our way through by looking for pointers to nodes that match the next letter in the word. Let's do the obvious here and search for cat. So we're gonna start at the node for the letter C. The next letter in our word is A, and so we need to find the pointer to the node called CA, which we have right there, we can make that hop. The last letter in our word is T. Do we have a pointer to a node called CAT? Yes, we do. Hop again. At this point, we've worked all the way through our search word and we haven't fallen out of the tree. So we can conclude that the word we were looking for is indeed in our library. Let's look at an example of a search for a word that is not car. So we're going to start at the same place. We start at C, work our way to CA. Great, still good. But now there is no pointer to any node called CAR. So we fall out of the tree and our search is a failure. That word does not exist in our library. Now, you might be saying to yourself, holy smokes, if we need to add a node for every valid prefix of every word in our library, that's gonna be a big tree. Fortunately, part of the beauty of this data structure is that it allows us to eliminate duplicate nodes. And for a data set like a library of words, there are a ton of duplicate prefixes. Let me show you what I mean by adding another word. And I'm gonna use car because it's sitting right there. Start the same way, we list the prefixes, C, C-A, C-A-R. And if we compare these against the nodes that are already in the tree, the only non-duplicate is the full word, C-A-R. So all we have to do is add that node and point to it from the existing C-A node. Awesome. If we wanted to add the word card, we would again only have to add one node. If we add the word ape, we run into a problem. We now have two trees instead of one, and we have no idea where to start our searches. But there is a cute trick to glue these together. We just add a node to the root to represent the empty prefix, basically a word with no letters in it. And because every word technically starts with that, we can just add it to the top, point to all of our single letter nodes, and now we have a universal starting point for our searches. Another tricky thing, how do we distinguish between prefixes that are full words on their own and those that are not? For example, if we search for the word ka, which unless you're here in Boston, is not a word, we work our way through, we end up at the CA node, and we haven't fallen out of the tree. So by our earlier logic, it's a word? No, it is not. So what we need to do is add a tiny little flag to each node indicating whether or not it represents a full word. We are in full control over the data that goes into these nodes, so this is not a problem. It doesn't cost much. 
So I told you this data structure allows for fast searching, but I'm not sure I've convinced you why. A search algorithm speed is judged by how many operations on average you have to perform to search for a given input. And the operations themselves can vary from algorithm to algorithm, but for a try search, the only operations we need to worry about are one, finding a pointer to a node that we care about, and two, hopping to that node. Now think back to the cat and car search examples that I just showed. How many hops did I do? For cat, it was C to CA to CAT, three. For car, it was C to CA to CAR, also three. It turns out if you build one of these structures for any list of words, the largest number of hops you're ever going to have to perform is equal to the length of the longest word in your library. So if you had a library somehow with a billion words in it, but the longest word was only 20 characters long, your search can never take more than 20 hops. And if you're not used to writing code, that might still seem like a lot to do in the literal milliseconds between a user's keystrokes, but you'll just have to trust me when I say that modern processors can handle that no problem. Power to you if you're still here watching. I only have one more technical thing to talk about, and as you can see, I have run out of normal places in my apartment to film. The last thing I wanna talk about is how everything I've described so far runs on this little baby microcontroller. Let's talk about memory for a sec. So when you run a software application on your computer or smartphone or even a microcontroller, generally what happens is some or all of that program gets loaded from long-term storage, like a hard drive, for example, into random access memory within your computer, also known as RAM. RAM can be read from and written to much faster than your long-term storage, but it's usually only a fraction of the size. So your program has to be careful about how much data it tries to keep sitting around. Now in an ideal T9 world, we would be able to load in our full T9 library try into RAM and just leave it there the whole time because we want our searches to be as fast as possible at all times. And on smartphones and desktop computers, this is totally feasible. Suppose, for example, that each node in our try, complete with all of its pointers, takes up an average of 40 bytes of space. Computers in 2021 tend to ship with at least eight gigabytes of RAM. That's more than eight billion bytes. So eight billion divided by 40, even with your operating system and a bunch of other applications running at the same time, it's safe to say your word library is not gonna make a dent. But microcontrollers are a different story. This is the Raspberry Pi RP2040, which only ships with 264 kilobytes, which is 264,000-ish bytes of RAM. And honestly, that's a ton compared to most of the popular microcontrollers you'll find slapped onto your favorite Arduino boards. So if we do that same math, 264,000 bytes divided by 40, we have room for about 6,500 nodes and nothing else. And we need a chunk of that back to fit the code that runs the T9 algorithm. So at best, we're fitting a few hundred to maybe a few thousand words in our library if we wanna keep it all in RAM on the RP2040. Frankly speaking, that's not enough for a proper T9 implementation. So I went ahead and figured out how to run this algorithm without needing to load the entire library into RAM. I create a custom file with a serialized version of the try that allows you to only read in the nodes you need at any given moment. You can think of a file as a long series of bytes and each byte has an implicit address, which is just its location in the series. In my file, these aren't just any bytes. These are the try nodes and their pointers all laid down next to each other. The magic here is that the pointer bytes have been configured to contain the exact address within this file of the nodes that they point to. So during a search, I can just read in a single node with its pointers, get the exact address of the next node that I care about, whiz past 
all the bytes that come before it and then just read in that node and start the process all over again. The only things that ever get pulled from long-term storage into RAM are the nodes that are actually a part of the current search and they can just be tossed aside as soon as that search is over. I wrote the code to build these tries and generate the library files from them in the Kotlin programming language. If you wanna see what that looks like, I have all the code available on this project's GitHub repository, which I will have linked in the description below. You will also find a Python implementation of the search algorithm because that is what's running on the board. This video was a bit of an experiment. This is the first time I've split out the technical details from the initial demonstration video. And I did this to break up my workload a little bit and also to spare my viewers who are curious about what I'm doing but maybe don't want to invest a full 30 minutes. And Jerry's still out on whether or not it actually helped me in any way, but I'm very curious to hear what you think. Is there anything you want to hear more of or hear less of? Let me know in the comments. I did get a few really good questions after the last video, and I'd like to answer them now. So the first and most popular question by far is, does this T9 algorithm, does your keyboard work with languages other than English? The short answer is kind of not really, not yet at least. So right now I only support plain old A through Z exactly as they show up on the keys here. But it is pretty trivial to add characters or variations of characters with accents and stuff. The problem is if I do that, the size of the library file will grow very, very quickly. So I need to figure out a way to optimize and maybe compress that library file a bit before I explicitly support extra characters. I also got a few questions and snarky comments about my use of CircuitPython for the firmware versus a lower level language like C or C++. If you don't know, CircuitPython adds an extra layer to your firmware. So any task your code needs to perform is going to take a little more time and energy to get done in CircuitPython than it would in C. I fully acknowledge that, and I fully acknowledge that it would have been possible to write every bit of code that I did for this project in C instead of CircuitPython. However, I was prioritizing development speed and iteration speed over processing speed. CircuitPython lets you treat your microcontroller like a USB flash drive and any time you save your code files to it, the board will reboot and your code will start running immediately. If I were writing in C, I would have to compile all my code and then use a special tool chain to flash it onto the board. The flash drive thing also means that I can send these out to less technical people and know that I can remotely coach them through dragging and dropping new files, maybe new firmware or a new word library onto the board and they won't have to install anything. It'll feel just like adding files to a flash drive. And beyond all that, I just write Python code much faster than I write C code. I think most of us do, even if we're too cool to admit it. So if my project performs the way it needs to for users, I'm going to choose the path of least resistance for development. If I end up in a world where I need to scale up production of these in a major way, I assure you I will reconsider. And if you are honestly concerned about how much energy a computer keyboard is wasting, I think there's a more obvious place to start that conversation. All right, that's all I got at this point for the T9 project. Thank you again for making it this far. If you wouldn't mind doing the things that every YouTuber asks you to do when you enjoy a video, I've got some really cool stuff coming through the fall and winter. I'm really excited to share it. So stay tuned, share this with a friend. I really appreciate it. Have a good one.